Turn with me in your Bibles this morning to the book of Hebrews chapter 2. And uh, we just ended a few weeks ago a series uh, that we've been doing called Preserved. And it was about the preservation of God, protecting our lives, preserving us uh, just from natural things. But also as we approach the end times, just believing God for his preservation and protection. So right now we're kind of in between series. I'm going to be starting a new series here in a few weeks, maybe uh, three or four weeks. But uh, in between series, sometimes I have some different sermons and different things that have been on my heart to preach. And uh, so now I have a few weeks to kind of preach some of those. So one one week to the next may not have anything to do with each other, but I believe that it will bless you. And so I I want to talk to you this morning about the work that Jesus did on the cross. And... You know, this is one of those things that you hear in church a lot or, or should hear in church a lot is about what happened on the cross. You know, what the work of Jesus did for us. But I just want to tell you that nobody has this thing completely figured out. And, and I believe that even for eternity, even that once we get in eternity, we will still be unraveling the mystery of what happened and how God reconciled man to himself on the cross. The Bible says that to those that, are being, those that are perishing, that the cross is foolishness. That it just seem, it's just so counter, uh, into, counter our intellect, you know, what happened on the cross. And you have to understand that what happened on the cross is not, it's, it's simple, but in the, at the same time it's not simple because there was so much going on that, that we didn't see behind the scenes. And so I just want to talk to you about some things that, the Lord has shown me about this. And we're not going to look at this this morning, you know, from an academic perspective. I'm not going to try to break down all the, the big words and theological words about what happened on the cross. That's, I just really this morning want us to sit back and, and look at in awe of what Jesus did on the cross and what it means for us today right where we're at. And uh, I know, you know, I went to, uh, to college and through, through seminary school and you know, sometimes people would treat like what Jesus hap- what happened on the cross. They would almost treat it like a, a science experiment. You know, like something to observe and to dissect and to look at from all different angles. You know, what happened on the cross is not a science experiment. It's something that changed my life forever and yours and the course of humanity. And I'm so grateful for it and I'm so thankful for it. But I believe we're going to be unwrapping the mystery of what happened on the cross for, for years to come, even in eternity. But the word that the Bible uses to talk about what happened on the cross is the word atonement. And, and this word refers to everything that happened on the cross, but specifically the fact that our sin was placed on him. Our sin was placed on Jesus Christ. Your sin was placed on Jesus Christ. Now, I want to say what we're going to talk about hopefully is going to bring you some understanding this morning, maybe that you didn't have before, because even if, even if I say some things that you already knew, the Holy Spirit can still, through those, can still teach you and show you things that you didn't know before. And as we hear and meditate on this word this morning, the Bible says that faith is rising in our heart. I believe that your soul can be restored this morning. But understanding every detail and every nuance and all the intricacies of what happened on the cross is not the key to receiving salvation and it is not the key to receiving everything that God has for you. It's important to understand it, but that's really not the key. The key is faith. The key is believing it, not necessarily understanding it. And there are a lot of things in life that are that way. Well, I won't believe that until I have perfect understanding. Well, you know, I don't understand when I get in an airplane all the exact dynamics of how that brick is flying through the air, but it is, and I believe it, and I don't really have to have perfect understanding in order, in order to receive the benefits. It's the same way with salvation or, or what happened on the cross. You don't have to understand it perfectly. As a matter of fact, all you have to do is believe. That's why Jesus said even a child can believe the message of the cross and experience salvation in their life. They don't, you don't have to have full, complete understanding. That's not the key. The key is faith. So you got to go ahead and purpose that in your heart this morning. Maybe you'll hear some things. Well, I don't quite understand that. That's okay. Understanding can come and it can be progressive. But faith can happen now. 
You know, you're supposed to grow. We're supposed to grow in our understanding of what happened. You don't have to understand the Bible. You don't have to understand Christianity. You have to understand the cross perfectly. But I believe in every human heart, there is a desire to believe this message. And so when you hear it and your heart begins to well up with faith, don't let the enemy or yourself come in and go, yeah, but I don't quite understand all that yet. That's okay. Understanding can come. It's progressive. But faith is the key. Faith can happen now. Faith can happen this morning. Amen. Now, of course, the whole Bible, beginning to end, from Genesis all the way to Revelation, is about Jesus. I mean, even all the old sacrifices, that you can find Jesus in every single, every single story. From Noah to Moses to Ruth to Esther, they all point to Jesus Christ. And it was a, it was, it's a miracle how God throughout history was pointing everything to Jesus. But I want to show you from the book of Hebrews, the perspective this morning that the book of Hebrews gives us about what happened on the cross. So in other words, I'm not going to read any other scriptures this morning except from the book of Hebrews. Because to me, the, he, the book of Hebrews has the best understanding, the best explanation, at least for me, of what really happened on the cross. We're going to start in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, and it answers the question for us here. I'm going to be reading out of the New Living Translation. I, I normally read out of the English Standard Version, but I'm going to read uh, New Living this morning because of how simple it, it puts it. But Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, excuse me, verse 14 answers this question for us. Why was Jesus the only one qualified to take away the sins of the world? This is one of the questions that people have sometimes about Jesus is, you know, why did he have to die? What was, what was the point? Why did he have to die? Why couldn't God have just forgiven our sins? Why did somebody need to come and make a sacrifice? If God is God and he's all powerful, why couldn't he have just pointed his finger and said, you know what, I'm going, to forgive. I'm going to forgive and that'll be the end of it. Why did there have to be a sacrifice? Well, listen to what Hebrews 2.14 says. It says, because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood, for only as a human being could he die. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death, only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. Listen to verse 17. Therefore it was necessary for him to be made in every respect like us, his brothers and sisters, so that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God. Then he could offer a sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people. So the Bible tells us that it was a human that had to pay the penalty. Why? Because it was humans that sinned. In the very beginning, God turned the planet and dominion of this planet over to humans, and we squandered it. We rebelled. We turned it over to the devil. And you can read that story in the book of Genesis. We squandered what God gave us, and it was a human that had to pay the penalty. And people always ask, well, why? Well, you have to understand that God is just. And God, you know, is not like us. For, we go, well, I know that's the law. I know that's the rules, but we'll just, we'll just bypass that and, and pardon someone. Well, listen, you have to understand that God's whole existence is based on his perfect character. And that if, if God did one thing that was not just, if he did one thing that was not righteous, if he ever told a lie, God would cease to be God. God is who he is because of who his character is. So... He was going to redeem mankind, but he was going to do it in a way that satisfied his justice. He was going to do it in a way that did not compromise any of his laws and any of his rules. So it had to be a human that would pay the penalty. Also, he had to be human because Jesus was going to be a substitute for us. He was going to stand in our place and receive the penalty that you and I Receive. Now, why did he have to be sinless? This is a point that's often, um, you know, made about Jesus' life is that he lived a sinless life. No sin. Never sinned. And when you think about that, it's so extraordinary because, yes, he was God, but he was also human. And he lived a perfect, sinless life, even though he was tempted literally by the devil himself. Now, 
I don't know how all the spiritual world works exactly. We know that the Bible speaks frequently about devils and demons. And uh, so we know that those, are, those things are there and they're in the spiritual world. We see uh, things in Scripture where uh, people were demon-possessed and, and so they had problems with demons. But, you know, here in the book of Matthew, we have Jesus being tempted by the devil himself. I doubt anybody in this room has probably ever been tempted by the devil himself. You might have a little, you know, under demon or something that's tempting you, or maybe it's your flesh even, not even a demon, who knows. But probably very few of us have had the devil himself. He's the master tempter. He's the one that ruined it all in the beginning with Adam and Eve. And he tempted Jesus. Now, the Bible compares Adam, the first Adam, he compares Adam and Jesus to uh, in, in a very similar way. Matter of fact, Jesus is referred to in the book of 1 Cor uh, Corinthians chapter 15 as the second Adam. So from that, we learn that the same authority that God gave the first Adam, he gave to Jesus as the second Adam. But the only difference was that the second Adam didn't screw everything up. He did it right. When he was tempted by the devil... See, Satan came to Eve in the garden, tempted Adam and Eve. They, they gave in to the temptation and they sinned. But remember, Adam had no sin nature. He was, he was perfect at that moment. He had no sin nature. He did not have to give in to, to sin and temptation. But he chose to do it anyway. Same thing with Jesus. Jesus did not have a sin nature. Why? Because Jesus was not a son of Adam. Jesus was the son of God. Every one of us in this room have inherited a sin nature from our father Adam. And that's why before you ever sin, the Bible is very clear about this and some people have issues with it, but before you ever commit your first sin as a child, you are guilty before God. And that's why some people don't understand. They go, well, I've never done anything wrong, which is a ridiculous statement to begin with. There's not a person on the planet that's never done anything wrong. But even if, let's say that you had, you have to understand you're guilty because Adam was guilty. And you go, well, that's not fair. Listen, you don't want fair, okay? You want mercy. Trust me. If you want to start talking about fair, God, believe me, God can bring the book out. And he can go down what's fair and what's, what we deserve and what we ought to get. But thank God, I'm not seeking fair. I'm seeking mercy. That's what I'm after. And so people, well, that's not fair. I had to be judged because of Adam. Look, listen, it's, it's, you, you're caught either way. Just pick your poison, okay? You're guilty because Adam was guilty, or you're guilty for your own sin. Either way, you're actually guilty for both, according to Scripture. But Jesus wasn't, because he, was, he, he did not inherit sin from Adam, because Adam was not his father. God was his father. This is the reason why the virgin birth is not optional. Some people want to believe the scripture they want to believe about Jesus, they well, I don't know about all the crazy stuff in there, like Jesus was born of a virgin. I don't know about all that, you know. Listen, if you don't understand what I'm talking about this morning, you don't have a Savior without the virgin birth. Because without the virgin birth, Jesus was born of Adam just like everybody else, and he inherited a sin nature just like everybody else, and he was guilty just like everybody else. But because God bypassed that process and God was his father, Adam did not inherit a sin nature. Not only that, the reason that Jesus was sinless and uh, the reason that Jesus could, could, could die for us because he was perfect is because he never sinned. So not only did he not inherit a sin nature, a corrupt nature like we did, he never sinned, even though he was tempted to. Now this is, you know, we don't understand it fully. How can he be God and yet still want to sin and, and not? Look, all, we'll, we'll understand it, you know, all in good time. But bottom line is the Bible creates this, this understanding that while he was still God, he was still tempted to sin. The, the book of Hebrews is clear about it. It's throughout the whole Bible that he was tempted in every point that you were tempted in. And temptation is not really a temptation unless it's really a temptation. In other words, when the devil came to him and, and tempted him, especially after he'd been hungry for 40 days and he tempted him to turn the stone into bread, that was a real temptation to Jesus. That means he thought about it. There was a part of him that wanted to do it. But he resisted the temptation, praise God, and he lived a sinless life. If Jesus had even committed one sin, none of this would have worked. If he had even committed one 
sin, he could not have been your substitute for salvation because he would have had to die and been punished for his own sin. The only reason he could be a substitute for us is because he was perfect. And so he did not have to die for his own sin. He did not have to die. And and the Bible says the wages of sin is death. He had no wages of sin. He was perfect. If he had committed even one sin, he would not have been able to be your substitute because he would have had to be punished for his own sin. It's kind of like if I had, you know, all this uh, history in my past... This can't even happen. It's not legal. But just bear with me for the sake of illustration this morning. But let's say that I had all this history of criminal activity in my past. And one of my buddies was in prison. And I'd never been caught or I'd never been punished for my sin. You know, I was on the run. They knew about it, but I was on the run. And and I went to the prison system and I said, hey, I want to be substituted for my buddy in jail. I want to take his place. I want to serve his sentence and I want him to go free. And they start looking at my record, and they go, hold on a second. You got your own record to serve, buddy. You can't be a substitute for him because you being in prison, all that's going to do is satisfy your own debt. It's not going to pay his. And it's the same thing with Jesus. If he had sinned, he would have had to pay the wages of sin. But the reason he could be substituted for us is he had no debt. He had no past, no history that had to be satisfied. And so he was the perfect Sacrifice, the perfect exchange. After this, after Jesus lives a sinless life and he he dies for us on the cross, the Bible teaches us that God appointed Jesus as our high priest. Now, To understand this, you have to have a little understanding of what a high priest was in the Old Testament. And remember, everything in the Old Testament was pointing to Jesus. The only reason God instituted a high priest was to give us an idea of the the capacity that Jesus would function in as high priest one day. So all the sacrifices, all the forms of worship, they all point to Jesus. But Hebrews teaches us that after the cross, Jesus became our high priest. Now, a high priest in the Old Testament, basically there was the people, there was God, and there was one person that stood in between man and God. Everyone was not allowed to approach God. Everyone was not allowed to to go into the, the tabernacle, into the Holy of Holies to see God. There was only one person, and that was the high priest, and even him... It was once a year that he would go into the, into the Holy of Holies. Sacrifices were made all the time, but into the Holy of Holies he would go in. And, and in the most holy place was the presence of God. It, the presence of God abided in the Ark of the Covenant, in the Holy of Holies. Pre, the literal presence of God was there. And before the, the Ark of the Covenant was the altar and the, the The priest, the high priest would go in and basically he would function as a mediator between the people and before God. And what he would do is he would go in with the lamb or the the goat and he would slaughter that goat and that blood would be placed on the altar before the presence of God. Right before the presence of God, that blood would be put on the altar and it was a sacrifice for the sins of the people. Now... In that instance, what, you, what the, the symbolism is that this pure animal, this innocent, pure animal that's never done anything has to give his life for a bunch of sinful people, you know, and that blood would somehow um, cover their sin. But even, even in that instance, Jesus was looking, when he would see that blood and he would see that, that sheep or that goat, it wasn't the blood of the sheep that he was thinking about. It was the blood of Jesus. Because in, his, in the mind of God, when he would see that, he, he didn't care so much about the goat or the sheep. He was thinking, even the Bible says that Jesus Christ was the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. So even before the world was created, God already knew that Jesus was going to have to be sacrificed. And in the mind of God, he was already slain for mankind, even before the foundation of the world. Of course, it still had to happen. It still had to play out. But God knew it was going to happen. And I believe when he would see the the sheep and he would see the blood of the sheep and he'd see the blood of the goat, that he was thinking about the blood of Jesus because he knew what was going to come. 
And so that high priest would function in a mediator in capacity between God and man. He would make peace between God and man. That was his role. But even the high priest was a sinful person, and he had to make sacrifices for his own self as well. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 1 explains this. It says, Every high priest is a man chosen to represent other people in their dealings with God. He presents their gifts to God and offers sacrifices for their sin. He was a mediator. Now, Jesus is the perfect mediator between God and man. Hebrews 4.15. It says, This high priest of ours understands our weakness, for he faced all of the same testings that we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Hebrews 4.15. Amen. So the Bible says that Jesus is the perfect mediator and the reason is because he walked as a man. He walked in your shoes. He was tempted like you. He had a body that got tired. He had a body that got hungry. He was tempted to sin just like we are. He walked as a human, and so he understands, even though he's God, he understands what it's like to be human. And for that reason, along with several others, he is the perfect mediator. Listen to Hebrews 5, 8. It says, even though Jesus was God's son... He learned obedience from the things that he suffered. In this way, God qualified him as a perfect high priest, and he became the source of eternal salvation for all those who obey him. This scripture tells us that Jesus was qualified to become the perfect high priest because of his obedience. So even though he was the son of God, he still had to live a life of obedience. He still had to live as a human before it would qualify him to be the high priest. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 27. It says, unlike those other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices every day. They did this for their own sins first and then for the sins of the people. But Jesus did this once and for all. For when he offered himself as the sacrifice for the people's sins. Amen. So when Jesus went in, even though the, the priests, they had to sacrifice sin every, every day. They would, they would make these sacrifices and it would cover the sin of the people. But what Hebrews is telling us is that it was actually pointing to a, a one-time sacrifice that would be made by Jesus. In other words, when he went in and his blood was put on that altar, which we're going to explain in just a moment, but when he went in and put his blood on the altar, it was finished. It was over. It was done. It was the only sacrifice that would ever have to be made for, for human sin. Again, it was the perfect sacrifice. Now, here's what I wanted to really get to this morning because this is such a key part of understanding how this happened and, and how it took place. In Hebrews chapter 8, 1, we get an awesome revelation. But, well, let me back up. When Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt and he brought them into the wilderness, one of the first things that God had them do was build a tabernacle. And if you go read through that, that passage, boy, I mean, it is so detailed. Every inch... Every centimeter had to be just right, the exact type of fabric, the exact type of wood, the exact type of gold. It had to be so specific. And the reason for that is because God, we find this out in the book of Hebrews, that God was not just coming up with the design of the tabernacle off the top of his head, but that this tabernacle that he was having Moses build was an actual tabernacle that existed in heaven. And inside that tabernacle, there, are, there, is an, there is an altar and there are utensils. Everything that he had Moses build is because this exact tabernacle existed in heaven. It was a heavenly tabernacle. We're going to see this in Hebrews chapter 8 verse 1. Let me put my cough drop in this morning. Getting halfway through. I don't want to have a breakdown. 
I know how annoying it is to hear the sound of a cough drop sucking in a microphone, okay? I'm going to do my best to avoid that. It beats the alternative, though. Okay, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1. It says, here's the main point. We have a high priest who sat down in the place of honor beside the throne of the majestic God in heaven. There, he ministers in the heavenly tabernacle, the true place of worship that was built by the Lord and not by human hands. So he says, in heaven, there is an actual tabernacle that Jesus ministers in as the high priest. And that this tabernacle, while Moses built the tabernacle on the, on the earth, it says that this tabernacle was built by the Lord himself. God built this tabernacle. And that's why he was so specific about how Moses built it. He gave him the exact dimensions, the exact engravings. Everything had to be perfect because he wanted it to be a replica of what he himself had built in heaven. It had to be perfect because it was going to be a replica of what was going on in heaven. Now think about this whole scenario to me. It just, and again, we don't understand it perfectly, you know, but I'm just trying to share with you this morning what I understand so far. I, I expect to grow in understanding and learning as every year passes. But in my understanding of this, what this would mean is that this tabernacle in heaven that God built from the creation of time, and it never got used until Jesus was sacrificed on the cross. It sat there waiting for the moment in history where the blood of Christ would be plied as a permanent fixture to that altar. And it says, G it says that God built this tabernacle by himself and it was there in heaven and it waited. And, and the altar and the utensils and everything. You know, there's no reason for these things to be used in heaven until that sacrifice that Jesus made once and for all would come. And so it sat there and it waited undoubtedly before Jesus ever came to the planet. He, he knew it was there. He saw it. He saw the altar. He knew what was going to happen. He knew that one day his blood would be upon that altar. All of heaven knew it. That's why if you read in the book of Revelation, when he's getting ready to open the seven seals... the all of heaven... Well, John started crying and he was upset because... There was no, no one that could open the seals. And John's crying, who's going to open the seals? And, and the Bible says that one of the angels touched him and said, don't, don't worry because there is one who can open the seal. And he turned and looked and he said it was as a lamb that had been slaughtered. Which of course represented Jesus. And he was the only one that was worthy to open the seals. And all of heaven began rejoicing and singing and crying out, worthy is the lamb. Worthy is the Lamb who is worthy to open the seven seals because he has conquered death. And because his life ransomed the sins of men. And I love when they opened the seventh seal in the book of Revelation. When he, when he opened the seventh seal, the Bible says that there was silence in heaven for half an hour. Can you imagine that? Jesus is there, God's there, the angel's there, everybody. And, and as he opened the seventh seal, because I believe it, it symbolized the end of time is about to begin, seventh seal opens, it says there was silence in heaven for half an hour. He just stood there in the presence of God, in the presence of the Lamb. Verse 5 of Hebrews 8, it says, They, talking about the earthly priests, they serve in a system of worship that is only a copy. It is a shadow of the real one in heaven. For when Moses was getting ready to build the tabernacle, God gave him this warning, be sure that you make everything according to the pattern that I have shown you here on the mountain. So again, he's, he's telling us in the book of Hebrews, Moses built a copy. And the reason that he was so specific, that God was so specific, is because there was a real one that he was making a copy of. Not only is the tabernacle real, but, but the altar and all the utensils. Hebrews 9, 23. 
It says that is why the tabernacle and everything in it, which were copies of things in heaven, had to be purified by the blood of animals. So you have to be familiar with some of this in the Old Testament, but once the tabernacle was built, the altar, the utensils, the candlesticks, everything that would be used when they dedicated the tabernacle and everything in it, they took the blood of a lamb and they sprinkled it on all the utensils, making them purified and perfect to be used. But he says the tabernacle and everything in it were copies of the original in heaven. So what happened at the resurrection? Hebrews 9.11 tells us, it says, so Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. He has entered that greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven. So it says, what he's telling us is after Jesus was crucified and he was resurrected and that blood had been spilled on earth. See, it wasn't just what was happening on earth. And that's what we focus on even in the movies and the pictures, you know, Jesus on the cross and he's bloody. But listen, there was something else going on in the spirit. It wasn't just what happened to Jesus naturally. Because in the spirit, and I don't know how it happened, I don't know when it happened, we're not told that. But at some point, Jesus took that blood from the cross and he brought it to this tabernacle in heaven. He brought it to the altar in heaven. And this is what it says. He has entered that greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven which was not made by human hands and is not part of this created world. But with his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves. He entered the most holy place once and for all and secured our redemption forever. Verse 24. For Christ did not enter into a holy place made with human hands, which was only a copy of the true one in heaven, but he entered into heaven itself to appear now before God on our behalf. Jesus Christ entered that tabernacle in heaven and he applied his blood to the altar. Can you imagine that moment? I, I can only speculate. I can only speculate. But that moment, I cannot imagine that this is the moment of moments. That this tabernacle had been in heaven for, how, for who knows how long. God built it. All the angels knew. Jesus knew. And it was the final moment where he had been crucified. And he was walking into the tabernacle with the blood that had just been shed. The blood that would be the sacrifice for all time. And he put that blood on the altar. And that blood, I want you to know, I want you to know and understand this. That blood that he put on that altar, it is a permanent fixture in heaven. It is there and it will be there for all of eternity. I believe that that blood will be a permanent fixture in eternity as long as we're there that people will still be in wonder and awe of what Christ did. They will still be in wonder and awe of what happened on the cross. And we will celebrate and worship because of that blood. And listen what Hebrews says that that blood is still doing today. Hebrews 12, 24. It says, You have come to Jesus, the one who mediates the new covenant between God and people, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks of forgiveness instead of crying out for vengeance like the blood of Abel. So in the Old Testament, again, everything pointed to Jesus. Even when Abel was murdered by his brother and, the, and God came to Abel and he said, Where is your brother? he says, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he says, you know, I don't know where my brother is. And he said, then why does the blood of your brother cry out on his behalf? In other words, that blood, the innocence of that blood was speaking to God. It, it, it had to be satisfied. It was speaking. It was crying out on his behalf. And here he makes that comparison and he says, the, the blood of Abel. Think about this. He says, the blood of Abel was crying out for vengeance. But he said the blood of Christ is crying out for mercy. It's crying out for forgiveness on your, on your behalf. 
and on mine. He says, it's still on that altar. He said, you have come to Jesus Christ. And he said, that blood is on that altar and it is crying out on your behalf for forgiveness for eternity. <laughs> Hallelujah. This is not... This is not a fairy tale. This is, not some, this is something that's happening right now. This is something, if you could see for just a moment, if you could go to heaven for just a moment, you could see that tabernacle. You could see that altar. You could see that blood that is before God crying out on your behalf. And I want you to understand this morning that he did it for you. It's all for you. Without you, that tabernacle wouldn't even exist. Be no need for it. Without you, that altar wouldn't even be there. There'd be no blood sacrifice that had to be made. He did it for you. I do not believe. You know, people hear this and people read the Bible sometimes and they go, well, man, why did God seem so angry in the Old Testament? You know, he seemed to you know, punish people and, and the wrath of God. And then in the New Testament, it's like all that dried up. Well, if you want to know why, all you have to do is understand that that altar was empty. And the moment that blood hit that altar, it was crying out on our behalf. And so we have forgiveness. You don't see God moving the way you do in the Old Testament, but it's not because he can't. It's because of that blood. That blood is on the altar and it's crying out for us. It's crying out for forgiveness. So I want you to understand that God is not mad at you this morning. He can't be. Because that blood speaks on your behalf. When you put, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, and this is, this is why salvation is based on belief. This is why salvation is based on faith. It's not based, nobody could do what I just described. Nobody could pay that price and that penalty. No, your good works, your nothing, you can't do enough anything that would make any difference. The only thing that satisfied the justice and the wrath of God was that blood. He did it. That's why it's all based on faith. Do you believe? Are you trusting in God for your salvation? You know, I, I see people that live in sin, even though they put their faith in Christ, and they live in sin, and they don't seem to have a problem sinning, and people debate, have debated for years. You go all the way back to the first century, the earliest Christians, they debate. Even you see it in the scripture. There's this fine line. Well, is that person saved, or are they not? You know, they wouldn't live like that if they were saved. They wouldn't have that sin in their life if they were saved. And there's been this debate going on. Well, are they saved, or are they not? Are they saved, or are they not? And, and here's what I know. Only God knows if a person is saved or not. But I don't look at a person's life and just because they have sin in their life automatically go, oh, well, they're not saved. They wouldn't, they wouldn't be sinning if they love God. Because let me tell you something. The blood is powerful. And it is not an excuse to sin. Matter of fact, Paul says that when we, when we use the blood as an excuse to sin, he said we crucify Jesus afresh over again. So it's not an excuse to sin. But I want you to understand this, that when your heart is pure before God, the issue for you is this. Are you putting your faith in Jesus Christ for your salvation? Are you believing that that blood covers you? Because I can tell you this from Scripture. You will have a better standing with God on the day of judgment. When you stand before Him and you have to answer for your life, you will have a better standing with God if you appeal to the blood than you do your good works and your good life. Because I see it in scripture where people stood before Jesus and they're answering for their life and he tells them to depart. He says, I never knew you. And they say, but Lord, we did this. And what do they do? They start going through all their good works. Lord, we did this in your name. We did, we did these good works. We did all these things. And what does that tell you that they're trusting in? In other words, they're having to debate with the God of the universe about whether they should be in heaven or not. And the first thing they appeal to is... They're good works. But I believe if I have to ever answer for that and I have to stand before him on that day and I'm asked, you know, why should you be allowed into my heaven? I'm not going to start going through my good works. The first thing I'm going to do is say, you know what? I don't deserve to be here. The only reason I deserve to be here is because of the blood of Jesus Christ that paid the price for my sin. And as a Christian, this is the defining factor. This is more important than we realize. 
as you walk through your life on a daily basis, what are you trusting in for your salvation? This is, this is so important. And, and we may go through it next week. But this is so important that in the book of Galatians, Paul is talking to a group of Christians that have stopped trusting in Jesus for their salvation. They don't realize they've done it, but they're going back to the law and they're, they're wanting to be circumcised again as a way to demonstrate salvation. And he says, listen, he, he tells them they've been born again, they're Christians, and he looks at them and he says, listen, if you begin to trust in circumcision for your salvation or thinking that somehow you can do something externally that will make you right with God. He said, I want you to understand. He uses these powerful words. He said, you are cut off from Christ. He says, you have been severed from the grace of God. And he's so frustrated when he's talking about it because they were teaching other people that in the church. Well, you got to be circumcised to be saved. You know people do that today? Well, you got to be baptized to be saved. Well, you got to speak in tongues to be saved. Listen, there's no external thing that you have to do to be saved. You have to put faith in Jesus Christ. You know, thank God for baptism. Thank God those, those symbols. But they are just symbols of an outward reality. They do not produce salvation. There's nothing external you have to do. And we have that wonderful example that's in the Scripture on purpose of the thief on the cross that turned to Jesus... You know, just and people say, well, the, the, the atonement wasn't finished yet, you know. Well, in the Old Testament, people weren't saved by putting their faith in Jesus. We've crossed over to the New Testament at this point. He is saved by putting his faith in Jesus on the cross. And when he puts his faith in Jesus, Jesus looked at him and said, Today you will be with me in paradise. He received salvation immediately. There was nothing external that we had to do. And so th this understanding is so crucial, and I don't want to belabor the point, but it's so crucial that you live every day with your faith in Christ for your salvation, your faith in that blood. When you question, when you find yourself questioning your salvation because, well, I hadn't lived right, I hadn't done just right, listen, think about the blood. Think about the blood that's on that altar. Think about the blood that's crying out for forgiveness on your behalf. It's there, and it's for you. And it's not just for you before you were saved. It's there for you after you were saved and throughout all of eternity. Praise God.